All right, good morning. Our hosts are disappointed the weather has gotten nice, so people want to go, people want to go, people want to go outside. Um, but I'm glad you intrepid folks are here. Um, I think this is a super important topic. We've got a great panel. Um, I'm Andy Rotherham. I'm a co-founder and partner at Bellwether Education Partners. Uh, I'm joined by two really interesting leaders in our space who have come together to talk about a, a, two, two both different but very interrelating uh, themes in this idea of two codes. Uh, Stephanie Sanford, um, right here to my immediate right, and Stephanie, uh, I'm gonna let them both introduce themselves in a moment, but Stephanie uh, has held uh, senior roles in the philanthropic world, the nonprofit world, and in state government, um, has a uh, just a fascinating eclectic background. Uh, she's also an academic, has written on generational change, and brings, so just brings a, a, an interesting set of experiences. Um, Hadi Partovi is a two-time successful founder in the private sector before he founded Code.org. Um, and, and he will tell you about this, how sort of coding and technology has informed his life and how he sees that uh, as an important code for life. Um, and you'll see that uh, in his story. And so we're gonna uh, hear from both of them a little bit about how they got here, their journey, what they think of when they think of two codes, what they're actually talking about, because it's one of these ideas that a lot of people are banding about, and so you, you get to hear it, um, you get to hear it straight from, from the two leaders here. Um, and then some Q&A, and then we want to leave a lot of time for audience Q&A, so please be thinking about um, your questions. And when we get to that, as you'll see, there's two mics in the middle. Um, I know that can be, especially in a, in a room where you're down front, that can seem laborious, but uh, it's being recorded for video, so if you would get up and use the mics, that would be fantastic. Um, so with that, why don't we start, Stephanie, do you want to just briefly like introduce yourself and as you think about this, how, how, how did your experiences and your background bring you to where you are today thinking about two codes? Yeah, so, so thanks Andy and thanks everybody for being here. Great to share the, share the dais with, uh, with, with two such great leaders. Um, so I've had a, a long time interest uh, in both of these topics, um, but I've been particularly passionate about democracy since I was a little girl. Um, my first political memory was not being able to go to Rodney Brister's birthday party because he had a McGovern sign in his yard. And my dad thought that Mrs. Brister was a communist and my mom was not so sure, but they were both extremely alarmed that she didn't wear a bra. <laughs> and so those were kind of the controversial issues that I dealt with early on as a child in the early 1970s uh, in, the, in the North Dallas suburbs. Um, but what that told me was that sort of democracy and, and civic life was something that got grown-ups all wound up, and that was something that I really wanted to, really wanted to be involved with. And, and so I've either been uh, studying or working in democracy for the next 25 years, and I've worked, as Andy said, um, mostly in, in state government, although I, I did a stint as a White House fellow. And, then, um, and so that was sort of my interest in sort of the code of democracy. Then, um, in 1998, the tech boom came to my hometown of Austin, Texas, and a lot of my friends decided to go get venture funding. I suspect that's what my, my colleague and friend Hadi would have done. Um, for some reason, I decided to go get a student cubicle in the UT Tower and start studying that whole thing. And so I uh, walked between my office and the Lieutenant Governor's office as technology policy advisor and a student um, in, uh, at UT uh, looking at the intersection of democracy, technology, and civic life, and that worked um, concluded in, uh, or culminated in a book called Civic Life in the Information Age that was a result of my dissertation. And that really looked at this, this intersection of sort of a, a changing technology world and the role of, of young people in it. And, uh, and so from there, I spent about 10 years at the Gates Foundation doing education policy and, and some programmatic work about really what does it take to prepare young people to be successful in, in a changing and a rapidly changing world. Um, I was there for about 10 years and then get, came to my current role where um, I lead policy and external relations for the College Board. And the College Board, you probably know from our sort of more, more famous um, programs and services, the SAT, the PSAT, Advanced Placement. But the thing to really know about the College Board is that our mission statement is right on the wall in every single one of our offices. And it says, clearing a path to help all students own their future. And that really is sort of the culmination of, of, my, uh, of my sort of varied and quirky career up to now, is figuring out how is it that, um, that we really prepare young people to, uh, to, to be successful as the, as the world is changing. And, uh, and so our work here today is really to discuss, we think, two of, of the most intense um, sort of changes and forces in our world, and, and that is sort of technology. Um, as the code of our economy and the Constitution as the code of our democracy. Terrific, Heidi, can you? 
Heidi, can you fill in a little bit on your story, all the, all the important things that I left out, and then how did that bring you to sort of how you think about your side of the two codes today? Sure, thank you, uh, and thank you for hosting me. It's my first time being somewhere that's been called a dais. <laughs> uh, it's very <laughs> exciting. Uh, so my childhood was very different than Stephanie's. Actually, I grew up uh, in, the, in Tehran, Iran, during the 80s, the, there was a revolution, and uh, you know, from ages six to 12, I experienced the, the regime under the Ayatollah. So for my experience with democracy was from early childhood experience the exact opposite of democracy uh, until I came to America as an uh, immigrant and saw a complete change in how government and society worked, moving from a totalitarian Islamic culture to, to uh, the democracy that we get to enjoy. Uh, uh, the reason I started Code.org is because as an immigrant, I had a lot of things against me coming to this country, but the one thing I had that was really in my favor was I had learned or taught myself coding and computer science. So I'd had a fantastic career in tech, starting as, uh, in internships at tech companies as young as 15 years old. And throughout my career in technology, I realized how hard it is to hire people with the right skills, and I realized it's because they're not learning them in our school system. Uh, and that led me down the path of starting Code.org and so my original vision was around creating opportunity for youth who want to go into computing jobs uh, at a time when computing occupations are the largest and fastest growing sector of uh, the economy and of all new wages. Uh, as we've run Code.org, one thing I've realized is that computer science is increasingly foundational, not just for the students who want to learn coding or who want to get into data science or cybersecurity or robotics or machine learning, but rather these technologies are impacting every aspect of society so whether you want to be civically engaged, whether you want to become a lawyer or a nurse or a farmer, every career in the future is being impacted by technology in ways that a K through 12 education can prepare you for. Just like we all learned a biology class that teaches us about how you know, the human biology works or we learn about how light bulbs work and electricity, these aren't things you learn only because you become a doctor or an electrician. They're to become, to become prepared in society. And so the goal of Code.org is to give every student the opportunity to learn about computer science as part of a foundational education. Uh, we're best known for creating the Hour of Code campaign, which has created a global movement for teaching computer science in schools. And we're about a few weeks away from this year's Hour of Code. Uh, we've, we've passed in the six years since the Hour of Code launched, over 800 million hours of code have been done, uh, reaching uh, more than one-fifth of all students on the planet, which is unbelievable as far as a movement that was started basically by American teachers that has now become such a global phenomenon. Uh, but one hour is not enough. Our goal is to get schools to teach computer science starting as early as elementary school through high school as a foundational field, just like you learn science or math. Uh, and what's exciting is computer science has now in the last six years grown from 10% of high schools to 45% of high schools. Code.org's courses are now used in one third of all American schools. So it's been a fantastic ride. And just a few weeks ago, we, we announced that every one of the, all 50 states have passed at least one policy to advance the role of computer science in K-12 education, which is a fantastic success, thanks in large part to this conference and the connections I've made and, and, and uh, from people who have basically heard this message at this conference and have gone back to your states to, to help pass policies to advance computer science. So it's been a wonderful ride. Thank you for having me. Huge achievement. Terrific. Heidi, do you want to talk a little bit more about when you specifically now, when you think about the two codes, what you're talking about? I know you have a video uh, to sure. walk through and like talk about like when, when, so help everybody get on the same page here. When you're talking about this very specifically, what do you mean? Sure. I have a quick video just to introduce the idea of computer science for those of you who haven't thought about it very much. I'll give that a run and then Stephanie has some comments about the, uh, her code. Second. Tenth grade? First grade. I was in eighth grade when I learned to program. I got my first computer when I was in sixth grade. What gets me excited is being able to fix people's problems. You can express yourself. You can build things from an idea. Computer science is the basis for a lot of the things that college students and professionals will do for the next 20 or 30 years. I like programming because I like helping people. I get the opportunity to build something that's going to make people's life easier. I think it's the closest thing we have to a superpower. Getting started is the most important part. I'm a beginner myself, and I want you to learn with me. 
This is a video of many of the videos that we show basically express the importance of computer science as a foundational field, not only as a vocational field, and to show that anybody can learn. Uh, what's exceptional is that the, the largest group of students on code.org are 11 or 12 years old. At this point, two-thirds of all 11 and 12-year-olds in the country have an account on code.org, uh, which is truly stunning. Anytime I've gone to presentations, if there's kids in the room, I can ask, uh, how many of you here use code.org? And the majority raise their hands. And I often have called on kids unexpectedly to come and demo coding for the adults. And the adults, often their parents are shocked that their children are learning this as part of the school system. Uh, and what's awesome about that is, first of all, that students can learn this young, they enjoy it, they love it, and more importantly, that our public schools can successfully teach computer science, which is not something people thought was possible five, six years ago. Stephanie, so same mm -hmm. question, level set, when you're talking about, what are you mm -hmm. talking about here specifically? Uh, so so the, Hadi just had a video about, um, about one code. As we think about two codes, we, we talk about you know, coding as in, as in sort of literal coding uh, as in, in the technology sense, but then we also talk about, uh, about code as, as the, code, uh, the code of democracy. To be an empowered citizen in our democracy, you need to know how the code of the U.S. Constitution works. To be an empowered and adaptive worker or artist or teacher, you need to know how technology works and how to shape it. Together with the National Constitution Center, we're helping classrooms to not only navigate society and its institutions, but also to improve and shape them and not just be shaped by them. We've created a First Amendment plan of study that gives students a deep dive into the fundamental tenets that open the Bill of Rights. To vividly bring these debates to life, we're promoting an online platform called the Classroom Exchange Program that allows classrooms around the country to sign up for constitutional conversations with classrooms in different parts of the country, moderated by a judge, legal scholar, or constitutional expert. You can be in a classroom in Odessa, Texas, with a moderator located in Philadelphia debating controversial speech with a classroom in Reno, Nevada. Teachers can register their classes to discuss a big constitutional question with a classroom elsewhere in the United States. The center facilitates these dialogues by pairing classrooms, connecting them with an expert moderator, and setting up video conferencing sessions. Students will analyze primary and secondary source documents via the interactive constitution to discuss and evaluate the common and divergent viewpoints on the First Amendment of the Constitution through a civil dialogue that allows students to determine their own point of view and why each holds a particular viewpoint. Our engagement with advanced placement students with the classroom exchanges is helping students become engaged citizens with honest, innovative programs that make the Constitution vivid. This work will undoubtedly unlock a wealth of educational resources, leveraging video technology to connect students across the country to the Constitution. This is the type of tool that breaks down the walls of the classroom and allows students to have these difficult conversations around the Constitution. Students in more than 30 states have taken part in these exchanges with the goal of reaching all 50 before Constitution Day 2020. So I bet as you watch these two videos that you think, huh, those disciplines are really, really different. On the one hand, in computer science, you get supermodels. And in the Constitution, you get me and an old guy sitting in the, in the basement of the National Constitution Center talking about the First Amendment with kids in Odessa and Reno. So you might be thinking, well, okay, so maybe these things really are, really are different and distinct. And we've typically kind of thought of them that way. Do you mind if I stand up? Please. Um, we sort of thought of them that way, right? As, as, as sort of different, different kinds of kids. You have sort of, you have coding nerds and you have, you know, and you have civic nerds. Guess which one I am. You could tell by my fascination with sitting at the Constitution Center. Um, and so we thought of them separate, but what we've really discovered now, particularly over, over the last couple of years, is that not only are the worlds of sort of technology and the Constitution um, increasingly interrelated, um, I would argue that they are, we need to, how do we, can I clear up a slide? There we go. 
that they're increasingly um, on a collision course. Now you may remember, you may remember this viral moment. So is this my, is this That's mine? One That's the one I need? This is the one that I clicked the slide, sir? Yes, awesome. Okay, do you remember this viral moment? So this was about a year or so ago. So this is a, uh, an 80 year old senator and a 32 year old billionaire sitting across the dais from each other at a congressional hearing. And this was about um, Facebook's business practices. And so a after several hours of kind of intense back and forth, the senator says, I just don't get how you make all that money when you give your product away. <laughs> okay, so right, that's, that's pretty funny. And you can actually see the look on his face when he answered that question, right? And so, um, so that's, that's pretty funny. And, and they were apparently watching this back at Facebook. And so here's what they did. They took a better picture of Mark Zuckerberg and they put on a t-shirt and they said, you know, Senator, we run ads. Now, and, and that is pretty funny, mm -hmm. except for you know what's not funny if we talk about this collision course between technology and the Constitution is that um, that 80-year-old senator and other senators like him are going to be making a whole bunch of decisions about the code of our economy. As Hadi said, fastest, you know, fastest growing parts of our economy, and they don't know the most basic thing about it. So that's not funny. And you know what else is not funny? is that that 32-year-old billionaire obviously didn't think too much about what would happen if you took 2.5 billion people, a third of humanity, slightly more people than percentage than code, but not much, third of humanity signed onto Facebook, and that's how many signed onto Facebook regularly. And what might happen if you gave 2.5 billion people unrestricted access to a, to a global broadcasting service with no editors, and no fact checkers, that that might create some kind of um, intensity or stress on democracy. So just in the last couple of months, the president of Microsoft, Brad Smith, put out a, put out a new book called Tools and Weapons. It's that, that, that uh, title itself sort of tells you that there's some good and bad going on at this intersection. And what he said at his book talk was that there were three kinds of people that he observed. Those who know a lot about technology, those who know a lot about democracy, and those who don't know much about either one. <laughs> so you know what Two Codes is about. That's about creating a fourth category of people, those who know a lot about both. And so we talked about this idea with Tom Friedman, and he, uh, and he wrote this piece about it um, earlier this year, this idea of two codes that young people need to know, that this, this potential collision course between the code of our democracy and the code of our economy and, for, and it really resonated. For three days, this was the most emailed piece on the New York Times website. And even more interesting, the editors of the New York Times put out a student prompt, and hundreds of students wrote in to say, yeah, this is what's going on. This is what's going on. This seems relevant to me. So we knew that we were onto something. And so now, how do we go about, in Brad Smith's parlance, how do we go about creating this fourth category of young people, right? How do we prepare them to navigate these two codes so prevalent in our economy? And so one, we've, we've set a goal that we want two million young people to earn college credit in computer science and government and politics by 2025. And how are we doing that? We're doing that through, through the changing up the content in these, two, uh, in these two courses. One, around sort of knowledge, skills, and agency, as we'll talk about. We, um, created a new computer science principles course that fundamentally off, uh, altered the invitation to students and through help with leaders like, like Hadi and other groups have dramatically, it is by far the biggest debut course in the history of, of advanced placement. And we redesigned the AP Government and Politics course to focus on the Constitution and the American founding documents, Supreme Court, doc, th Supreme Court cases, and the debates of the day. And as you can see, partnering with the National Constitution Center, figuring out how do we animate dialogue across that very technology to be able to have young people grapple in a civil way with these big issues. We're looking to have internships and projects and to be able to cross-pollinate those projects to say that our government and politics students, civic geeks like me, will go and do projects to figure out what are the implications of, of technology and solving real problems. And people like Hadi in our computer science courses, how is it that they put technology to work in doing things that would help our democracy? And clearly implicit in all of this 
is a, is a fundamentally different way of looking at partnerships. This isn't something that the, that the College Board can do. It's something that we see as immensely important in the world in, the, in, in how it is that we think hard as an, as an educational institution and like all of you in this room, figuring out what is it going to mean if the world is moving more quickly and these two huge forces are sort of on a collision course in our country, how do we work together with a range of organizations to be able uh, to be able to prepare young people not just to, to navigate it, but to, to actually to actually command it. So we've got the, here are the, sort of the elements quickly of the campaign. One is a is a big goal. Two are our external partnerships, like we're going to talk about, and you've just seen in in, in Huddy's in my video. This notion of policies. Um, now I didn't know that all, that 50 states now have some sort of uh, uh, computer science requirement. You're seeing um, well over half now have civic requirements. Can we make those more robust and figure out a way in which that we do cross pollinate them? Since we're seeing some of the most intense parts of our um, of our civic and public life are going to be faced by young people at this intersection. We're leaning into gender equity, particularly in the tech field. It looks pretty good in government and politics, but in, in the tech world, it doesn't. And Hadi and team have been super helpful in helping us and the field really lean into that. And then this notion of underrepresented student credit. Um, we, on purpose, say we just didn't want to put a whole bunch more kids into courses. We actually want them to do well on the exams and get college credit because what we know is young people who get to get a three or better are one more likely to graduate and complete college, and two they're more likely to major in those to major in those topics. And so, um, just sort of a quick sense of uh, there's a little bit of sort of a Hawthorne effect when this this conception of these two things that we've historically thought of as separate, but now we see interacting in the world. These are just a few headlines just from the last week or so about how technology and our civic life are interacting with each other. I think that you'll find that, I find that now I almost see, I mean, and, and people on my team will see sort of a two code headline almost every day. So when you ask me sort of what is two codes, that's how, that's really how we're thinking about it. We're very early stage in that. We've got some of our resources and so forth up there, um, but, but excited to work with and recruit sort of partners in the, in the policy and programmatic and advocacy world to be able to advance this idea. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Question to both of you as you think about sort of expanding this. Talk a little about the challenges and the opportunities both on the supply side and on the demand side for this. How do you, how do you increase the demand uh, and how do we make sure there's, a, there's an equitable supply and particularly, Stephanie, there, you know, we have a, a number of challenges around the teacher workforce. How do you make sure there's an equitable supply there and, and how, do you, how do you make sure there's equitable, equ equitable access on that uh, supply side as well as increasing the demand? Sure. Uh, well, I'll speak about computer science. Uh, when you say demand, none of us need to know about the demand at the sort of workforce level demand for students learning computer science. Uh, but the demand most people don't realize is how much students want to learn this field. Uh, in fact, a group called Change the Equation did a survey asking students, what class do you most want to study? And the number one class was art, number two was dance, number three was computer science. So. Uh, I'm not going to talk about where their other courses mm -hmm. fell in terms of what mm -hmm. students wanted, but considering that this is the field that literally leads to the most economic opportunity uh, and is foundational for so many careers, and it's the number three thing students want to learn after dance and art, uh, the idea that only one out of ten high schools even teaches AP computer science principles is really wrong. So mm -hmm. APCS principles has become the fastest growing AP course in history, uh, and it's rocketed up to almost 100,000 students taking the course. That's only in about 5,000 high schools. 90% of high schools don't even offer this class. And so if, if you're a parent uh, or a student going to one of those schools, the option to even learn this isn't even available to you. Uh, and so that's the demand that is not being satisfied, not just from the workforce, but from the students who want this preparation. Uh, the biggest challenge or obstacle is not, it's not that schools don't want to teach computer science. They're not sure who's going to teach computer mm -hmm. science. Uh, you know, if you, if you ask the school to teach government, they'd probably look at the history teacher and they'd be like, here's a curriculum, have at it. And they're, they're not, the history teacher isn't like scared, I'm not sure about how I'll handle this. They, they, they're like, I got this. Uh, if, they, if you say, let's teach computer science, the teachers kind of look at each other like, are you going to do this? Are you going to do this? Um, and there's a little bit of intimidation because most teachers didn't learn computer science growing up. 
Uh, the work we've done to, to turn this around has been to build a, a nationwide network of partners who basically offer year-round professional learning opportunities so that existing school teachers can become computer science teachers. And we've shown now successfully that the history teacher, the math teacher, the, the science teacher, even the art teacher can successfully teach computer science if they go through a professional learning program. Uh, and what's been the most surprising learning from this, because when we started this, everybody thought that you know the young techie teachers are gonna be the ones who are gonna be most interested and most successful. Uh, and we've looked at all the you know, thousands of teachers now who've gone through our professional learning programs. And can you guess the number one thing that determines the teacher's success at getting students to learn the course and actually get good assessment results? It's the, the number one most correlated thing has been the teacher's age and the number of years they've had in the classroom. In fact, our teachers who are in their 50s and 60s are getting better test scores than our teachers who are in their 20s and 30s. And that's not because uh, of anything other than showing that experience in the classroom matters in getting students to learn, but it also shows that an older teacher with very limited access to technology from their childhood, very little exposure to this from their education, can successfully learn to teach something as, as advanced as computer science and get the kids to not only take but also pass AP exams. Uh, the challenge we face is that this success has only reached about 10% of high schools and we need schools to, to basically ask their teachers to go through the professional learning to make a slot in the schedule to teach AP computer science principles and for states to provide funding to actually spread this course. Yeah, and by the way, when mm -hmm. I mentioned 50 states, 50 states haven't made a requirement for computer mm -hmm. science. They passed some sort of policy. You know, most of these states have said not that computer science is required, but that if you take it, it satisfies an existing math or science requirement, so it can be, it can count towards graduation. Uh, before mm -hmm. Code.org started, most states didn't even allow computer science to count mm -hmm. towards graduation. Now it counts towards high school graduation in most states. And uh, a little over a dozen states have done things like requiring that schools must teach computer science or funding the professional learning to make it happen. Uh, but to get computer science to be available for every student to have an opportunity to take it, we need schools to put their teachers through the professional learning programs, and we need states to pass policies to either require or fund schools to teach computer science. Uh, so, no, I, I think that's right. You guys have done an amazing job with a really broad variety of teachers. So to the question about, um, about supply, I mean, the obvious is to, have, is to have courses in schools and then teachers able to teach them. Um, I, I believe that the, the uh, graduation requirement has been the most effective towards increasing the number of graduates for, for our computer science. Um, so um, courses in schools, then, then teachers in professional development to be able to teach those courses, then sort of equitable access in, uh, by, um, by students into those courses. And you've, there are a number of other kinds of providers, places like Girls Who Code and others who are really working on the pipeline to figure out how to get more diverse students into those, um, into those courses. Um, I think as well, when the, the real power in how is it that you then cross-pollinate these courses, because I think that that's right. You do see now increasing number of states, numbers of states have civics requirements, and then to, to have those courses then available, and then what are the ways in which through um, internships, other kinds of partners, that um, the, almost the sort of project-based learning that brings these topics and their intersection really um, really alive, alive for students. And, Already you're seeing a lot of the tech companies are very interested in internships. I believe Amazon, uh, for their future engineers, I believe all of the students that they picked um, were AP Computer Science principal students. So there's a big value proposition um, around these courses. Um, and even in, in places like uh, like like local government, I know some of the you know some of the concern about civics and and government and politics in uh, in schools is like oh yikes politics in our current uh, in our current polarized environment. We've got a partnership now with um, uh, with Generation Citizen, and I share the the dais with another with another really inspiring leader who uh, Denora Gatachu who runs um, actually who runs uh, Generation Citizen for New York City, and she talks about how. Um, by by helping, you know, their, the way they do it is you learn about local government, and then you uh, and then you learn how to access it, and then you have a project that accesses local government. And what that has done is that by ha by focusing on local problems or local government, that keeps you out of sort of some of the more polarizing, issue-based, more ideological things, while still building a sense of agency of your ability to then be able to make a difference. 
Um, and she also kind of thinking about this sort of intersection or tension between, um, between, between technology and democracy. She um, helps her, her uh, students understand the difference between sort of real agency, and that is to learn about how your democracy works and be able to make a difference in it and what it takes to do that over time, as distinct from a word she uses called slacktivism, which is mistaking the, uh, you know, the use of the, of the like button or the retreat button uh, as, as somehow a substitute for actual civic engagement and agency. Sure, I want to I'll get this right for the very last <laughs> question. Um, I want to make sure we allow time for, uh, for questions from the audience. If you all want to start coming up, uh, people who have questions, uh, just line up at either. There's a mic towards uh, the back. There's a mic here. Just go ahead and, and, and come on up. No need to even raise your hand. Um, before, but as people are coming up, a question for both of you. Talk a little bit about the pushback you get. I mean, how do you earlier talked about how you see this as it's, there's a universal nature to it. You said you called it foundational, not vocational. But you do hear a lot from people who feel like, and you hear this sometimes from teachers, this is one more sort of vocational thing that they're being asked to do in an already crowded school day and school week. And Stephanie, you alluded to um, are the times we're living in politically, which I think, um, I don't know, maybe they could be better. Um, uh, Talk a little bit about, like a little bit more, like this idea, like the five freedoms, like we're having debates, and there's, there's generational issues as people even think about things like the First Amendment, views on it are evolving. So like how does that complicate and what are some other challenges? Uh, when we get pushback, it's usually from a misunderstanding of our message. So uh, we get pushback from people who think we are asking that every student must learn computer science, whereas what we're saying is, Let's get every school to offer the opportunity so that if your school is going to, 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 if your student is going to school, no matter what neighborhood they grew up in, no matter what the color of their skin, their school offers a class and they have the opportunity to learn that. You know, the, the reality is access to computer science right now is directly correlated to income and race. Uh, and that's not something that as Americans we should feel proud about, that our schools don't offer computer science to your, to your student if you're in a poor neighborhood. And if your student is black or Hispanic, their school is less likely to even offer this class. As soon as you say that, there's very little push, pushback on saying, let's solve this problem. You know, we're a country that is founded on an ideal of equality of opportunity. And having the, the highest paying, most hottest demanded field in education not be available to students in the poorest neighborhoods is the most upside down idea of equality of opportunity you could think of. Uh, and this really gets to this message of the importance of diversity in this field. Uh, you know, Getting gender diversity in computer science has a lot to do with starting younger and breaking stereotypes. Getting racial diversity in this field is primarily an issue of access. We've found that when we teach computer science in schools with uh, highly diverse racial populations, the classroom mirrors the school diversity. Uh, so the issue with not having enough students of, of, of black or Hispanic backgrounds uh, at least graduating and taking the AP exam isn't because they're not interested. In fact, in surveys, they are more interested than white kids in learning computer science, but less likely to have it even as an option in their schools. Uh, and that's such an important problem to solve. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, by the way, is we're talking about codes, but computer science is more than coding. Uh, and one thing we're particularly interested in at code.org is expanding the concept of what is taught in, in computer science classes in schools to teach about artificial intelligence and machine learning, and also the ethical impacts of these technologies. Because uh, you know, whether it's computer science in general or AI in particular, uh, these are technologies that are gonna be changing things in all sorts of ways, and students need to understand not only how to harness this, this technology, but how to use it ethically, which then links to the mm -hmm. uh, issues of our constitution and de democracy. And absolutely, I, uh, I, I, you know, we use the word code in part because I, that fetching hat that you wear, um, but it is a shorthand. I mean, code. I mean, the, the notion of a code is is a set of instructions that you give to a system to make it work, and so you understand how that works. And uh, and I, and I think that in both of these uh, in both of these disciplines, um, an increased focus on problem solving, on really under uh, understanding how a machine works, and then being able to have the know how and the agency then to be able. Um, to, to navigate and understand how it works. So the question of, push, of pushback, uh, my answer is similar, to, is similar to Hadi's, which is you have pushback, you have pushback about the way things are today. You have pushback which is, you know, computer science is either not available or it's not diverse or you have in, uh, you have in sort of government and politics or civic courses that the kids are ignorant, they don't want to do it, or things are too polarized. And what we're trying to do here is actually solve those, uh, it, you know, is actually solve those problems in the world. Doesn't mean that they're, 
um, that these questions aren't complicated, that I mean, teacher certification um, in coding stereotypes, or um, you know, again, a polarization or teacher reticence to take reticence to take on controversial issues in a classroom right now. But it, uh, there is no doubt that there is need for it. Um, the other thing, that just sort of to the political polarization question, really excited about our work with the National Constitution Center. Um, Jeffrey Rosen, if you all don't know him or know the, the interactive constitution, it really is genius what they have done. And, and part of that is to say, um, there, Wayne, the idea that there's pushbacks against the, against the five freedoms of the First Amendment, they don't even, I mean, young people don't even know what they are. I mean, uh, something like half of them can't name one of them, much less all of them. And so, the way that these, the interactive constitution and particularly these classroom exchanges, essentially this, the, we go through the freedoms of the First Amendment, so you learn about it, and then you debate constitutional issues around the freedoms, as opposed to do you think free speech is a good idea or a bad idea, or do you like or not like hate speech? Mm -hmm. You have a discussion about you know, what are the freedoms and what do, and, and what do different, consti what does the constitution say, not what do you like or not? And again, I think in both of these disciplines, even though they seem so disparate, they are both about uh, learning, uh, learning a discipline, learning a set of skills, and then applying it to solve problems in increasingly sort of complex and interdependent ways. Terrific, thank you. Yes, ma'am, why don't you tee off our questions. And let's try to, uh, we're not in Washington, um, so I think this will be in, in Washington, like we have questions that really aren't questions in the interrogative sense of that word. Um, and that is sort of par for the course. Since we're on the <laughs> West Coast, we're going to model. Uh, let's have questions. We can get through as many of them as possible. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm Jennifer Johnston from Alaska. And love to have both of you come up to Alaska. We could be a great Petri dish. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my question is, is you know, I've, I've got grandsons right now that every culture, every age group has its stars, has its rock stars. And, and their rock stars right now are, are 12 year olds making money on um, um, YouTube, YouTube videos. <laughs> YouTube videos with Minecraft. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder as you look at, the, at this conversation, because sometimes what we have to do in education is one of the hardest things is remain constant, but also go to where the child is. And do you look at that kind of setting as an opportunity? We absolutely do, although one thing I should say, and I have a 12-year-old son, uh, any parent knows one of our, the concerns with young kids these days is addiction to their screens and video games. Uh, so, uh, and actually, I thought you were going to ask about that when you started your question as well, so I'll talk about both. We've actually partnered with Minecraft, and one of the most popular activities on Code.org is a series of activities where you basically build your own Minecraft adventure using code so you can create your own rules of the game by changing, you know, the, you've, you start by learning how to control the Minecraft characters in, on a web-based sort of simulation of Minecraft, and then you can ch change the rules of the game by coding them yourselves. Uh, and it's far easier than sort of modding inside the real Minecraft, which is, is a lot more advanced. This is one of the most popular things on code.org. And in fact, before we had it, the number one request we constantly got from students was to make an hour of code with Minecraft. Uh, I'd visit classrooms and they give me thank you cards, you know, thank you for making the hour of code. And I realized half of the thank you cards were requests for doing something with Minecraft. <laughs> like, thank you and please, you know. Uh, so now we have that and it's been a fantastic way to, to reach those students. But with respect to uh, screen time and addiction, it's important for parents to recognize that not all screen time is bad. I limit my kids' ability to do things like watching YouTube or, or just, you know, playing games. But their time spent on learning and creativity I don't constrain. If, if a student is coding or if the student is mm -hmm. painting on their, on their screen, uh, those aren't really bad. And in fact, in our computer science curriculum, half of our curriculum is offline and doesn't involve a screen because students need to learn that, that a lot of the concepts of computer science don't need sort of a digital screen to understand. Uh, so we make sure our, how we model teaching of computer science isn't continuously in a screen so we don't reinforce that kind of a screen time concern. Hi, I'm yes, Joyce O'Halloran, um, Deeper Learning Advocates in Portland, Oregon. Um, and one of the things we advocate is teaching governance before academics. And we don't mean in terms of teaching a class. We mean in terms of embedding democracy in the school culture and not the, uh, you know, superficial thing of a student council, but m making real decisions. So have you explored that? 
um, that avenue of embedding democracy in school culture? Uh, absolutely, and I think that um, uh, you've got uh, Louise Dubay and, and a whole session on, on Civic Ed and the Civics Now um, uh, Coalition, and one of their principles is exactly that, is the, the sort of, you know, what are the ways in which students can have authentic experience in, in actually acting in democracy. I mean, we're, we're looking to, within the AP Government and Politics course, learn about it, but then also have those kinds of opportunities within the course. But clearly the broader civic education community is, is absolutely looking at those exact kinds of authentic experiences broader than just within the classroom. How about authentic experiences within the school? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Marguerite Rosa from Edunomics Lab at Georgetown. I'd love to hear how you're thinking about graduation requirements because I'm sure there are some people here saying, if it's not in the graduation requirements, it's not gonna get done. And mm -hmm. schools put it aside to focus on graduation requirements. And then there's that whole push for computer science to be a language. So just would love your thoughts mm -hmm. on all of those. Sure, yeah. um, so the policy push we've made was to make computer science count towards graduation. And what that means is not to just count as an elective, but to satisfy either math or science requirements. Most states have a number of years of math you need to take or in a number of years of science, such as four years of math and three years of science. Some states have different requirements. And we've wanted to, and we've pushed for states to allow AP computer science to a computer science credit to satisfy one of those requirements so students can choose if they need to take three sciences, one of those can be computer science. That isn't requiring that every student must take it, but it creates an incentive uh, because in the past, the way students would look at it is they'd sit with their college counselor, would say, take all the requirements, and then you need to take some electives, and for the electives, find the easiest class possible to get your GPA up so you have a good GPA and you satisfy the requirements. And so computer science would not stand out as the easiest class to get your GPA up. Now they say, let's look at the requirements and computer science is on that list. When we make it on one of the courses that can satisfy the requirements, we see a 25% increase in total enrollment and a 50% increase in enrollment among young women and students of color. So not even requiring it to be taught, but offering it on the menu, which still only 10% of schools do, and then uh, uh, also allowing it to satisfy the one of the math or science requirements is enough to boost enrollment. Yeah, I think the language one was, I think that was one state. I'm looking at Jeff here. Jeff, was there just one state that, that used... Uh yeah. That it was like you want yeah, to use computer science as a language. There's a couple of states that have pushed towards making, yeah, allowing language. computer science to yeah. replace a language requirement, and we've not been strongly supportive of that. It's, it's possible to do, but it's, you need to make sure you get it right because there's some challenges if you just say computer science satisfies the language requirement because you, you don't want to have language teachers be the ones that are certified for teaching computer science, and you have to worry about will students get into colleges that require you to have a foreign language uh, and so there's, it's a little messy to change that without thinking about these unintended consequences, uh, but that's certainly been an approach that some states have taken. So you're, are you anxious that kids might replace a math class with computer science? We're not anxious that kids would replace calculus with computer science. In fact, the head of the AP program of the College Board has said they wish computer science was more popular than calculus. It's not offered in as many schools. It's, it's think, not taken so by as many students. So I think if states have three years required for math, they might come in and take algebra, geometry, and computer science, right? And so never get to kind of a, I guess that's, that's the only thing that scares me a little bit about that requirement or that mm -hmm. um, arrangement. I'm, I want the kids to take computer science. I'm not sure I want to see another math class go away to make it happen. And civics requirements, you, you've got a, a number of states have a half year moving to a, to a full year. Um, I think you're, you are seeing a, a movement towards that sort of requirement for graduation as well. As you think about these trade-offs, have you in your work, either of you, is there any, I mean, school schedules are always a hot topic, you know, block versus traditional and these things. Have you found models that work better for, or better or worse in sort of avoiding some of these false choices? Like you were saying, you don't want to see languages necessarily go away, but you want to see this added. Have you seen models that help avoid some of those choices? Yeah, we get constantly asked by school administrators, how do you fit something new in? Uh, what do you take away? <laughs> um, because this question of if you add something, you need to remove something. Uh, in middle school, the answer is outdated tech ed, which actually in most schools is this thing that the school wants to take away. They have a class that teaches 
how to search the web uh, and how to create a document. And that those are literally the learning objectives. And everybody involved is like, why are we teaching this? And this the teacher, the students just feel like we have to do this because the system tells us we have to, and the administrators are delighted to upgrade that same class to remove or shorten the learning for how to search the web and replace it with how to create the web. <laughs> you know, um, At the high school level, uh, what we encourage is not to require, if you don't require computer science but you make it an option, the students choose yeah. what classes they go through. So you offer one section of computer science and students vote with their feet in terms of what they sign up for and you know, one other class might lose some hours and computer science grows in hours. Uh, what we find is once you make that available, inevitably students want more than one section of computer science. Student demand ends up causing the school to need two hours of computer science a day so they can support two sections worth of students. Uh, and that means somewhere else some teacher or some class is losing hours, uh, but ultimately students should have that choice uh, and no school would say, no, let's not let those students take that class because they must learn some other thing. Uh, so that, that's how it ends up working out. And, and we've done, we're doing work sessions exactly the same way, which is that looking at this, this question of supply of student uh, and of student demand for these kinds of courses. Um, as well, we've, we've um, talked with administrators and teachers about what are ways in which, if you think about these two courses and two codes together, what are ways in which potentially to sequence them at what, you know, at what time during the year. Right now, a lot of them take, take it later in, the, in, their, um, in their high school career. Uh, and so what are ways to, to be able to, to sequence them well, look at them potentially with a capstone diploma or other ways. But there's a, there's a lot of interest and dynamism in figuring out how to answer that question. Just anecdotally, it does seem like there's some room to innovate there. My kids, uh, there's a class in their school where they basically learn to bake cookies, which is fascinating <laughs> since half the weekend, every weekend, they're baking cookies. It doesn't seem like it's something they need a great deal of instruction on. Um, yet uh, coding and computer science has to be an after-school activity because there's not enough time in the school day. Wow. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Carla Nelson from Minnesota, Chair of uh, Ed Finance and Policy. And uh, this is such an interesting session because we've dealt with both of these things, mm -hmm. uh, more computer science in our schools and civics. And you've kind of um, talked about the issue that uh, still is hanging out there that has caused some um, opposition that we've not been able to come yet, come over, uh, overcome yet. And that has to do with the time. Mm -hmm. the, there is a set amount of time that our kids are in our schools and there's a set amount of uh, courses they need to take. And so if we add civics, for example, uh, the question is then uh, computer science is easy. That can be um, a science course or a math course. But civics, um, maybe I'm, I would like you to talk a little bit about what that could be included, uh, civics, as one of a particular type of course requirement. And then also if you could speak to uh, the best time to offer that. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, controversy in our state about uh, the Minnesota School Board saying, you know, the senior year is the most difficult year to require that. Some civics um, um, advocates saying, well, that is the time that it needs to be offered. So if you could speak to that, and then thirdly, if you could speak to civics, uh, and, key, and you mentioned that keeping it in, on local issues to keep it out of the contentious a national piece. Some are concerned about civics being used as advocating for a particular whatever the teacher right. or the school might, might have important. Yeah. Yeah. So if you could speak to those three issues, uh, that'd be incredibly helpful. Thank uh, you. Okay, so one, a civics requirement. Uh, you have states that are adding it. Sometimes they have it as a, a civics requirement on its own, sometimes as, um, as, a, history, as a history requirement. Uh, the question of the best time, um, you know, I think uh, it is typically, at least AP government and politics is offered, um, is tends to be offered in 11th or 12th grade. Then it, it involves, that's when you're they're most interested in voter registration and things like that. Um, the the, uh, the civic ed folks, I think, could see it offered any time and, and earlier is better or even civic education back into, you know, into middle school. Um, and particularly if you think about some of these governance questions, which is how, how do you um, sort of engage students in the life of the school. I don't know that there is an, an optimum time. You know, as we think of it as potentially a two codes bundle of activities, we've talked about uh, that, uh, if you did that as a, you know, as almost a capstone, so you would do them potentially in order and then with a capstone project at the end, which would imply you know, sort of 10th or 10th or 11th grade. I don't think there's a, a magic, there, that there's a magic, uh, 
you know, approach to that. Um, as we've um, talked with, with whether that's AP teachers or administrations or our members or others, they're trying it in different ways. And, um, and I think you're going to see a lot, of, um, a lot of experimentation with that in different kinds of schools. <clears throat> the, uh, the question of, of, a, of worry about politics is a, is a live one that comes up, comes up all the time. And I think that um, uh, the, the couple of ways that we're dealing with it now, one, we talked about a, a focus on local issues and, and a focus on knowledge, skills, and agency, not, not opinion. So that if you focus on you know, the Constitution, source documents, and uh, you know, Supreme Court cases, and you debate the constitutionality of things, that mitigates that somewhat. The notion of, of uh, generation citizen, which is an action civics, which some people worry about the argument that you just laid there, that that becomes a, a form of activism or you know, political activism as opposed to sort of civic engagement. Uh, that, that um, the order of learning about things, then taking a problem and then engaging locally seems to, to mitigate some of that. But, um, and then the work that, that we've done with NCC actually across classrooms that then enables um, some just practice of engaging on these, on issues and constitutional principles and being uh, sort of moderated either by sort of judges or constitutional experts to build up the practice of sort of civil and civic engagement on, on issues. Those are all ways that doesn't fix everything or completely eliminate the problem that you describe, but these are the strategies that we're seeing to mitigate the immediate reaction of, oh my gosh, people are going to be talking about the presidential election in their, you know, in their classrooms. But the rest of them were so easy. Okay. okay. Well, uh, and then, do you believe that the uh, civic um, education can be part of an existing history course or social studies course, or does it need to be a civic class? The, 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 yeah. The question. The question yeah. is, for, so you all can hear, is, is can this can civics can it be embedded in other courses? Oh, or does it need to be a distinct class? Could it be embedded in in in, in history. I, or I think studies? I think there I think there are different ways to do that. I mean, we're with the College Board, and we've redesigned our AP Government and Politics course, and we think that it's particular, you know, that it's particularly effective to to sort of to set up a, you know, the the ability to sort of learn about our constitutional system, practice it, and then get out in the world, and that that creates uh, a sense of agency, which is its own sort of, um, uh, sort of a virtuous cycle. Uh, that said, um, the, the, in my you know in my view, the more we can have this kind of civic engagement and principles embedded in other kinds of classes, the better off we are. Okay, so question for you guys. Uh, this will have to be our last question. I, th I think um, Heidi and Stephanie will stick around uh, to take additional questions. You got a room full of policymakers, lawmakers, advocates, influencers. What do you? What would you like to see them do to move this issue forward? What do you need the people in this room and people like them to do? Oh, well, I have a hard request and an easy request. The, e the harder request is if your state doesn't already do it, to either require schools to teach computer science or to fund schools to offer computer science to, for teachers to go through that professional learning program to be able to teach a computer science course. Now, that's the hard request and requires actual policy work. The easy request is in about three weeks, we're going to have Computer Science Education Week and the, the Global Hour of Code campaign. And in every one of your states, there's going to be hundreds of, or even thousands of schools hosting Hour of Code activities. So the week of December 9th, uh, consider going and visiting a classroom that is doing an Hour of Code. It's a great opportunity to see what computer science looks like at a classroom, anywhere from elementary school through high school. Uh, and it's a great way to, to, to show your constituents your support for computer science education as well. Uh, so I, I, I would echo that. Um, I think that the, the access, the access to, to these courses, um, not, not, not to go to necessarily to mandates, although you certainly have states doing that, but um, the idea of, of having these courses in schools and available to, and available to students. Um, this question of teacher certification, um, there are some places that, um, th that have 
uh, particularly for computer science, a, a, a really unrealistic uh, sort of teacher certification requirement such that essentially if you, if you met that sort of computer science requirement, you'd go, to work at, you'd go to work at Microsoft. You wouldn't necessarily be a teacher. And what we found with these endorsed providers, code, code being the leading one, is that you really can take a great teacher and turn them into a great computer science teacher through, um, through this sort of professional development without having to go necessarily and go do a thousand hours somewhere. Um, and then, um, so I would say that, that primarily these, these questions, uh, these questions of access and teacher certification um, are, I think, are the, are the easiest and the first step. Um, then I think that your support of things like Hour of Code and, the, the, and keeping the, the notion of, of diversity and broad-based access that we really are about, uh, about all students, not just certain kinds of students. These disciplines are going to be at the, at the center of our adult and public life, and we need to have a broad base of students have access and command to them. I was wrong. I didn't even get it right in the last one. Um, all right. Thank, please join me in thanking Hadi and Stephanie. Yeah. Thank you all. And like I said, I think they will stick around uh, for the questions we didn't get to. Thank you. <laughs>